Greetings and salutations, everyone. Uh, welcome back to the Tuesday Trouble at Love Bites Heart. I hope you've had a wonderful time so far this week and that you are wearing a mask and washing your hands and taking care of yourselves. So this week, I want to talk about what defines a successful and by extension, unsuccessful relationship. I mean, yeah, it's like a weird place to start but I think that you'll see why it really makes sense. And yes, I'm definitely eventually going to talk about things like how to meet people, how to start relationships, you know, how to gauge how it's going. But before we even think about that, we kind of need to know what we're looking for. It's like if you decide that you want to start hunting, for instance, um, but you don't really think about what kind of game you want, I mean, you need to think, how many people do you need to feed? How much freezer space do you have? Are you a vegetarian? You're not going to be terribly well equipped out there on the outside, regardless of what kind of equipment you think you have. It is possible to be under-equipped or over-equipped. So, just like with jobs, Successful can mean a lot of different things depending on your context. We need to start by examining what legacy artifacts or even malware might still be installed that nudges our expectations, uh, sometimes quite a lot. So I want to begin with proposing a postulate or an axiom that a successful relationship is one that provides you with everything that that specific relationship is capable of providing. All right, so as we see up here, an axiom or a postulate is a statement that is taken to be true, to serve as a premise or starting point for further reasoning and arguments. The word comes from the Greek word, meaning that which is thought worthy or fit, uh, or of that which commends itself as evident. Okay, but um, what do we actually get out of relationships? What are they for? Now, the societal kind of knee-jerk reaction is to answer and say security or love or health benefits. Uh, you can also say guaranteed sex partner or Saturday night movie partner, but that's not what our relationships really provide us on a deeper level. Rather, consider that relationships, all relationships, relationships with your parents, with your siblings, with your lovers, bank teller, boss, co-workers, complete strangers on the bus, each provide you with an opportunity to examine yourself first. Humans are really weird. Uh, I mean, yeah, but humans are really weird in that we are first selfish and very self-serving and this is the child phase okay it requires a conscious process to convert our emotional state to one of empathy compassion the outward gaze it's a huge part of what puberty really does for us in and a lot of times our rites of passage are designed to take us from me love which is different from self-love We'll get to that a little bit later. But from me love into group love, right? us -ian society might be a little disadvantaged, very disadvantaged, because we have no rites of passage that perform the same function. Our rites of passage are things like buying your first pack of cigarettes or your lotto ticket when you turn 18, even though you might not smoke or gamble as a general rule. Or you can go get blazing drunk when you're 21. That's super. The closest thing that we've actually got to practicing group love as a rite of passage is uh, registering to vote when you're 18. But most people don't even really understand what that means and, and how it's an action of group love. So that means that our very best opportunity to evolve our self-concept is through the eyes of others. 
a romantic or intimate relationship is the deepest means of self-reflection possible. Um, I've mentioned before, and I will absolutely mention again, that no two people experience you the same way. You are a different person to every single person that you meet because there's no way that two people can see through exactly the same filter of events, experiences, their own perspective that created their worldview. This is part of why you can date a person and think they're absolutely amazing, uh, but if you ask their ex, they are the worst piece of shit on the planet. <clears throat> the second part of uh, the second part of this concept is that no single person can provide you with a complete view of yourself. Your parents, obviously, they provide some of it. Your lovers, your boss. The bigger question is, what do you do with this information, with this reflection of yourself, this view? Well, I mean, what happens when you look in the mirror and you see that your hair had a wild party last night and didn't even bother inviting you? You know, you grab a brush or a comb or worst case scenario, clippers, and you fix that shit. What happens though, if you look in the mirror and you see this gorgeous face looking back at you, it happens a lot. You feel good about yourself and you wanna make sure that you keep doing that thing with your eyebrows or your smile or whatever. So you like to keep feeling good. This is kind of the first phase of a relationship. It's that opportunity for self-reflection. The second phase, uh, which honestly can happen at any point before, during, or after the first phase is empathy. And that's connecting with someone else's being or experience in a way where you understand and appreciate them significantly. Now, appreciate does not mean, wow, oh, you're super duper, although obviously it can. Appreciate means to recognize the value of a thing. So sometimes that value is less than a shit covered turd rolled in dung and a pile of guano. And sometimes it's more awesome than um, a monkey wearing a tuxedo made out of bacon riding a cyborg unicorn uh, with a lightsaber for the horn on the tip of a space shuttle closing in on Mars while engulfed in flames and in case you didn't know it, that's pretty dang sweet. Thank you, Flint. To bring it back to the point though, the key element is that these twin events of self-realization and empathy happen. And when you empathize with somebody on that level, you are recognizing their value. You're recognizing that you can see things from their perspective you could never see before in any of your other experiences. It might be, wow, uh, I, I don't, hmm, hmm. That might be that, that powerful thing. <clears throat> but the twin elements, self-realization, empathy, it means that a relationship can also be successful to you. If we count this as what makes a successful relationship means a relationship could be successful to you, but not be successful for the other person. I'm just not that into you. I mean, that's one of the worst feelings in the world. When you feel like you can be your best self around someone and see their best qualities down to the corners of your soul, or even just feel a connection that inspires you in ways that you don't feel with anyone else, but this is really important. They're not actually required to return the connection. I mean, it's nice, but they're not required to. Now, what gives that experience the potential to make the relationship is when both parties have the zing. You know, they have that mutual two-part thing going on. And here's the thing about zings. Uh, they don't just happen once. They don't have conditions. They don't even occur in the same way twice. In fact, almost never. 
And sometimes they leave as quickly as they came if you're... Sorry, elephant crossing. Oh my God. All right. Sometimes they leave as quickly as they came if you're not in a position to nurture them. They sometimes don't have any logic to them. In fact, uh, kind of a lot. I don't know why I'm into this chick. I just am. Until you kind of consciously recognize what it is you're experiencing. And that is that empathy that and that self-reflection. Um, sometimes successful relationships are really short. They only provide a little bit of insight. Sometimes they last the rest of your life. But a relationship that lasts, oh, I swear. But a relationship that lasts the rest of your life is not necessarily also successful. <clears throat> and you totally have and totally should have more than one successful relationship in your life. <clears throat> Excuse me. Oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. Now, you've heard me talk about side quests before. And I want to throw this out there. I, I want you to know, deep down in your heart, that you are not a failure at love if you find yourself stuck in endless side quests and never finish the alleged main storyline. And honestly, anybody that has ever played Skyrim can attest to this. If you are dating and dating and dating, and honestly, you oh, sort of God, I got elephants in this house. If you're dating and dating and dating, and you actually feel satisfied with what you're accomplishing in those relationships, but it's never quite right to grab the brass ring, gold ring, whatever. There's nothing wrong with that. I see so many people stressing themselves out over the lack of the wedding event instant, um, you know, getting triggered, but it's really not that big of a deal. I mean, why do you want it? This is, this is something to examine for yourself. Why do you want that? Why is it important to you? But a lot of times they stress over not being successful in their relationships in a way that of, sort of gets in the way of them examining what they accomplished or learned from their relationships. You know, so because this instance never triggered, they get hung up on um, what went wrong. They obsess over what's wrong with them or what's wrong with their former partner or partners. They could get stuck in a cycle of not lovable enough or how they have bad taste in partners or all pick your preferred gender suck or whatever. When really an honest examination reveals that none of these factors, none of these things was ever a real factor. I'm here to give you explicit permission to not get sucked down that hole. Basically what I'm saying is just because a relationship ends doesn't mean that it's a failure. Every single one of them. Good, bad, boring, flashy, sad, happy, abusive, toxic. All of them had an opportunity to teach you something not just about the other person, but about yourself, as we've established. And this means, and sometimes this is the hardest thing to really grasp, that even if a relationship was crap, if it was unfulfilling, abusive, toxic, absent, if you learned as much as you could about yourself and developed a level of empathy for the other person, by our postulate, it was a successful relationship. This doesn't mean it was a happy relationship. 
but it satisfied the conditions of our axiom in that it provided to you everything that it could. Now, for the record, I will never ever say anything like, everything happens for a reason, unless that reason is that um, you're acting stupid and making the same mistake over and over and over again. There's no woo-woo destiny that brings things together except by the chaotic factor of all life, which is a whole other conversation. Things happen because they happen. However, I will strongly encourage you to make the best of any and all situations, no matter how fucking awful they might be. And trust me, I have personally been through some of the worst, worst situations. Brief recap, just in case. Even if a relationship, let me try that again. Even if a relationship was crap or terrible or awful, it was successful if you learned everything that you could from it. Now, here's why this is important, and this is why I'm reiterating this. One of the things that we, because I've done it too, torture ourselves with when a relationship turns bad, when a relationship turns out abusive, when a relationship turns out toxic, is that we did something wrong that we failed to make it successful, that, we, that we're that we quitters, that we, we gave up and... No, no, that, that was good. That was a good thing. Because a successful relationship teaches us about ourselves, teaches us about the other person. You get everything that you possibly can out of it, everything the relationship is capable of giving you. Let's say short of death, and hopefully before massive you know, hospital bills, Hey, congratulations, you won. Weird, I know. But really thinking of it this way is a huge, huge boom. All right. Now. So I'm going to recap this comic over here. Um, kimchi cuddles, by the way, Tivga Wolf. Huge hearts, oh my gosh. So to recap this comic, I'm sure it's way, way, way too small for everybody to read. Um, there are links provided and everything wherever we can. These two folks uh, had an enormous attraction for each other, but their life circumstances just didn't quite match up. Maybe they had too much on their plates. Maybe they lived in different cities. Maybe their polyam dance cards were too full. Maybe they weren't practicing polyam at all at that point. Maybe their work schedules were opposite of each other. That has happened to me. Or maybe they were recovering from recent past relationships or other types of grief. They only shared this brief moment of deep soul level adoration and then they went on with their lives. Whatever the reason for going their separate ways, the point that the comic makes is that you don't, first of all, <laughs> you don't have to justify your feelings with action. Your feelings are not more valid because you did something inspired by them. And more so, you don't validate those feelings more, especially if taking an action is going to hurt you or your partner or your other partners or whatever. In our axiom, this relationship actually satisfied all of the needs. These two people got everything out of the relationship that it was capable of giving them. And it was this peak experience. It was this beautiful moment. And that's all it had to be, you know? So yeah, a five minute relationship is still a valid romantic connection. <laughs> Oh my God, if you let yourself fall in love, because honestly, falling in love is the most perfect moment of reflection, joy, empathy, 
Enjoy is a big word. I mean, we use it kind of, uh, yay, joy to the world. But you know how happy isn't big enough? Go lay down. Go lay down. Freaking elephants, man. Oh, my God. Get your toenails clipped. What the heck? This is why these streams are going to last so freaking long. It's because of these guys, I'm telling you. Anyway, <clears throat> joy is the word that we want to use when happy isn't big enough. Elation it doesn't quite last that long, but peak experience, uh, kind of closer. But, you know, for everyday man, joy is it. it. Doesn't have to last forever. It, I mean, could it? Eh, probably not. It's not practical. But if it lasts five minutes, if it lasts a lifetime, two years, uh, six months, 20 years, if it never culminates in sex, if it never even has regular communication, never turns into a traditional impression of our real relationship, it doesn't matter. The purity of the emotional connection, the self-reflection and empathy, that's what matters more than anything else. Because love teaches us about ourselves before it teaches us anything about anyone else. It's, it's how it do. It teaches us what we are capable of. It teaches us how we can view the world, what the little tiny beautiful things are, what the great massive expanses are. It teaches us how deep that joy can really go. And sometimes, very frequently, how deep our sorrow can go. Because those two depths are completely equal. As Khalil Gibran reminds us, they issue forth from the same well. Now, as far as those unculminated and pure relationships are concerned, I've actually had a few of them in my life as well. Um, and I was uh, very deeply tortured just by the sheer magnitude of what I felt before I realized that I didn't have to validate them or act on them for them to be real. Now there were two occasions that come to mind, both of which happened before I had ever had any idea what polyam was. Uh, you know, in both times I was in a you know, relatively committed relationship and uh, in both cases, I developed feelings for my partner's best friend, like uncomfortably intense feelings. But of course, I didn't want to choose. I didn't want to cause a problem. You know, I was the newcomer, you know, I was just the new chick. I never write to, you know, get in between anybody. And so, you know, at the time I just sat there, you know, tortured, confused. I know I keep using the word tortured, but uh, Wow, man, I can do a number on me. It's crazy. But I also wanted to spend as much time as I could with the, with the respective best friends because they made me feel solid and real and appreciated as something besides a sex thing or a romantical partner or whatever. And it was, was an element I was not getting from either of the other relationships at the time. And I'd, I'd like to think at least that there was some attraction going both ways, but you know, none of that was ever acted on because it just wasn't a thing that you do. You know, it, it's, it was like, it was like going over to your neighbor's house, you know, because she had like the best tea and her place always smelled like exotic spices and there were cats and lush plants everywhere and she talked about faraway places and, and strange things and wonderful adventures and then still going home after your folks got home in the afternoon because you still love them and that was where dinner was gonna be. So the first one, um, 
The first one taught me the joy of sculpting tiny things, of making dolls and giving them personalities and jobs and purposes, you know, old men and fishermen and, and old women and, and ugly humans and strange dogs and, you know, all that kind of stuff. It was, it was very, I'd never seen dolls or even puppets in that, in that way before. And they also taught me a few Spanish words that we used around our Hemingway cats. And we had a lot of Hemingway cats. You know, they're the cats with the thumbs. And it was weird because for the first time, Spanish actually sounded like a real language instead of like background noise that I couldn't understand. And this isn't, this is not a slight in any way shape to Spanish speakers, but my autistic brain kind of filtered it out because and of course, I didn't know this at the time, but I was so overwhelmed all the time with sights and sounds and noise and texture and smells that I think it just had to shut some things off. You know, oh, brain doesn't know what this is. It's clearly not a threat, so ignore. You know how these things go, right? Um, <laughs> the other one uh, was a musician. And they taught me about electronic music and that age didn't matter nearly as much as experience. They taught me that sometimes, you know, your friends don't have the best habits or beliefs and you can consciously choose to go along with it mostly so that they don't push you away for rejecting them. And then you can actually be there for them to keep them out of the worst levels of trouble. They taught me that soft nudges and knowing glances can be just as, if not more powerful than harsh words or screamed ultimatums. They taught me how to let people lie to you. Even when you know they're lying, just to see how far they'll take it. That trust is not always about whether or not somebody is going to be true or honest or faithful to you, but rather how true they're going to be in what they believe about themselves. I would like to think <laughs> that I brought each of them some value as well. Uh, maybe how to laugh at goofy things like funny flush, or maybe how to take things too literally, or maybe that there's always an answer. You might not like it, but there's an answer. Um, but in the end, now I don't actually speak to either of them. The doll maker is, you know, God's nowhere, and uh, the musician committed suicide a few decades ago. They're both with me all the time, though, because being with me is not a requirement to being the object of my love. And I still value and use the gifts that they brought into my life, so how can they be very far away ever? <clears throat> now, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> because I'm twelve, uh, I once wrote a whole article uh, back on my other blog uh, in, in 2014 about how uh, naked isn't sexy. It's actually about uh, trust and vulnerability. People can be completely unclothed and still not be naked. Sometimes people use layers of clothing to, not necessarily to denote, denote modesty, but levels of trust. And if you think about it, modesty is kind of a level of trust. It's, it's you know, how much do you trust the world to respect your being? How much do you trust yourself to share with others? Um, people who've been together enough to share deep, deep trust might sleep and they're all together all the time, but only rarely have sexual exchanges because they don't need to. They have the trust, they have that intimacy. Or, you know, maybe they, they get it on all the time. Not a big deal, we're not judging, that's fine. 
Another way to put this is as truth. You know, people think that intimacy is about sex, intimacy is about truth. When you realize you can tell someone your truth, when you can show your true self with them, when you can stand in front of them and their response is, you're safe with me, and that is intimacy. And that is true. That goes back to vulnerability. To put it as truth, let's expand on this a little bit and touch on a point that I am actually going to harp on quite a lot. And that is that truth is not the same thing as honesty. And I think what this meme here was really going for was uh, was both about truthfulness and let me try that again. Uh, truthfulness and honesty, because truth is about facts, and honesty is about emotions or opinions. Right? This is a red chair. That's the truth. We can see it. We can verify that it has you know two arms, four legs. It's made of a non-fabric material, probably plastic, right? We can maybe debate about, you know, what the purpose of it is, where it lives, you know, what it's like to sit in it. That would be an honesty thing. You know, developing an opinion about it. But the facts are, it's a chair and it's red. In all likelihood, it will not change from being a red chair uh, without some sort of external influence. It could, you know, sit out in the sun in Texas for like five minutes and get bleached and it's no longer red. It could get broken into little bitty pieces with an ax. Now it's no longer a chair. Honesty is a little different in that it refers to how you feel at any given moment. Um, it is about how your feelings and your opinions change over time. So it's completely honest to say that you were angry last week, but you're not angry anymore. Or that you love this one restaurant, but you've gotten kind of tired of it now. That doesn't make you a liar for saying that you don't like that restaurant now, even though you did before. What would be dishonest is if you said that you never liked that restaurant, but that's not, that's not honest. Um, a much more common dishonesty is when somebody says, are you okay? And of course we all reflectively say, I'm fine. <laughs> Bitch, you are smoldering and smoking from having just been on fire. You are not okay. You need some serious help. And even if the flames are technically out, oh my God, have a band-aid. But in our weird world, we don't trust people enough to be honest with them unless we have established a relationship of trust already. Now, femmes, femmes are decided, I swear to God, I'm blah, blah, blah. Excuse me a moment. I wet my whistle. Femmes are defined as anyone at all who identifies full-time or part-time as female. Assigned sex at birth, wears a frock a lot, trans, any other variation. Don't give a shit. If you identify yourself as female, full or part-time, you are a femme. Femmes, especially, are societally trained to default to, I'm fine, I don't need help. Particularly if an unknown man walks up and offers to help because we've seen or heard or know personally how many times this kind of situation can go horrifically, horrifically sideways. See, most predators are opportunists. And our culture of toxic masculinity has societally trained way, way, way too many cis men to be predatory. You're going to have a whole other discussion about toxic masculinity versus healthy masculinity later. Do not flood my comments or inbox just yet, all right? But what this does is it breeds this distrust into every part of our emotional process. 
Femmes, almost to a one, have had lovers, friends, family, whatever, all of whom started in a place of trust and then turn out to be abusive or shitty or neglectful or dishonest or lying or whatever. So for femmes to let down their guard and enter into a place where they can honestly be a thing at all, all right, they have to want to do it. They have to be in a mental and emotional place to even consider it. They have to see evidence on some level that the object of their interest is capable of handling that trust. They have to overcome their past programming that being honest is unsafe. They have to feel strong enough within themselves to handle rejection if honesty is still unsafe. And they still have to wait for a socially or personally appropriate opportunity to test the waters for that honesty. You're right, it's exhausting. And this, the thing that we call Femmes who have to go through this process again and again and again is called hypervigilance. And it, yeah, it's, it's like an entire half of the species has PTSD. And in a lot of ways, we do. We're going to get into a whole part of that later. But understand, for femmes to trust, either they're being self-destructive if they trust too quickly. These are all judgments, by the way. Two, uh, self-destructive if they, if they uh, trust too quickly, or they're being reckless, or they're being prudish if they don't, or they're being stuck up if they don't, or they're making bad life choices if they don't trust you, or, I mean, I mean, I mean, oh. All right, so, um, for cis men, and again, I'm making the distinction between trans men and cis men from the first place because trans men start from a different place. Um, even when they start and are aware of themselves very, very young, they just don't have the same patriarchal beatdown, all right? So, uh, for cis men, uh, the time to really uh, let down your guard and to be honest is almost never. Because they've been taught that their feelings and their emotions are weaknesses. And their tears are stupid and if they were honest about how they feel, um, then they'd be beaten down or they have been beaten down, emasculated. No one is ever going to respect them and respect is all. And you gotta be strong at all times and always suck it up. This is fine, everything's fine. Hey, too much blood on the inside is way unhealthy. Chicks dig scars, oh, it's merely a flesh wound. Back on my feet in no times. Intestines totally grow back, right? <sighs> So you got these two sides, and let me tell you, uh, same gender relationships, it just doubles the trouble in all the ways. So how do you build trust at all with someone, let alone enough to create intimacy? How, how do you do that? I am so glad you asked, because the answer is technically, you don't. I know, weird, right? But the thing is, the absolute best you can do is to just be a trustworthy person. Be mindful of your words, own the consequences of your actions, don't be a dick on purpose, apologize when you fuck up, develop awareness and consciousness about your own emotional state, question your perceived reality against consensus or objective reality, or, you know, as close as we can get to objective reality, and then the decision to trust you lies with the other person. I mean, because it's not like you can pump trust actions into a relationship like coins into an arcade machine and then one day, ha-ha, trust pops out. 
the other person has to actively choose to trust you. And if they have had experience or issues with trust in the past, you know, it's going to take a while sometimes, but it's on them to fix it. All you can do is be a good person or a partner and then let the rest happen. Somehow, some way though, it does happen. And when it does, you just got to run with it. And you have to run with what you are provided. Okay, because not all trust is 100% the same, you know. Hey, I would trust this person with my car, but I wouldn't trust them with my money. It's like a dog. I would trust you with my kid. I do not trust you with my food. Yeah, I'm talking to you, butthead. I know you can hear me. I got a story, man. So, all things being equal, okay, you, you've had your zing, you're building your trust. In order to really determine like this long-term success, how can you really tell what you've got going on? How can you tell you're going in the right direction? What are the signs that it could be, or even currently is what you could call successful? Of course, we started off with the basics, you know, oh, well, all relationships are successful if they satisfy these needs. But yeah, you're not here to just talk about abstractness. You want love, happiness, long-term happiness, ideally. And so the list that I'm about to share, it does lead towards the longer-term version of successful rather than the five-minute version because, you know, hey, it's really hard to, I mean, just getting undressed. I mean, you know what I mean. So the first thing is communicate effectively. Okay. That means all kinds of things. You, you want to talk about the fun things, you know, like money, sex, drugs, but you also want to talk about the unfun things like laundry, chores, childhood trauma. Effectively communicating isn't just, hey, let's talk about things that you wouldn't talk about with anybody else. Yeah. It means knowing how to listen. And it means knowing how to mean what you say. And it means trusting your partner to kind of tell when you're having a problem communicating. So, as you might have noticed, sometimes I have a hard word with ways. I've had to train my partner to give me a moment so that I can dig around in my word bag for the thing that I mean. Like earlier today, telling my offspring, no, put it in the box that makes things hot. Quickly. It was the microwave, I had to look it up. But the reason that we have this effective communication, my partner and I, is because he is patient enough with me to let me get the word out, words out. Listening, super important. Listening honestly is super important. And that means being conscious and aware of what your partner is saying and not just listening and waiting for there, there to be a break so that you can jump in and reply. Reply. Oh my gosh, man. Hmm. Excuse me. You're not supposed to see my nylons. Excuse me. I'm sure that's gonna come off. Great. All right, are we fine now? All right, we're fine now. Um, yeah, so effectively communicating means going in both directions. The second thing is compatible values. Sharing values, uh, and if you listen to the, um, the pre-wedding sermon, 
you know that shared values is actually one of the biggest indicators of whether or not a marriage is going to be successful. And it's really a big topic that's not completely easy to quantify. Oh, excuse me. But the big ones are, um, do you guys have compatible political views? How do you feel about children? I mean, do you like having them? Raise it? Do you want to have them? Raise them? Discipline them? Stew them? Raise them? It's, you know. Um, what's your stance on current event topics like LGBTQ rights? You, you know what I mean. Black Lives Matter. Um, mask wearing. Hand washing. Tax paying. Gun toting. Gardening. What topics, what things are you really, really passionate about? What hobbies are you passionate about and why? I know that sounds like a weird shared values thing, but quite frankly, if uh, partner A loves to go out and, you know, um, do a lot of shows and go to a lot of out venues and out things and the out with the shows and stuff, but partner B is like, and I want to sit and watch movies at home with the subtitles on so I can pause it to go pee. Well, you guys might have a couple problems. Now, does it mean that you guys are absolutely not going to make it work? Not at all. Because it says compatible values, not the same values. And if you have the same values, it'd be freaking boring as fuck, right? Ugh. No, I take that back. If you're having a boring fuck, you're definitely doing it wrong. But that's a whole other stream. These are the big, the big questions, though. Compatible values. Can you work stuff out? Which, of course, goes back to communicating effectively. Now, this one is a little weird. And it's going to take me a second to, to explain this, but I think you're going to uh, appreciate it. Gauging resiliency. Now, this, of course, relies on communicating effectively and actually some com compatible values as well. But gauging resiliency is to say, how well do you, you, your partner, collective you, how well do you change your mind about something if you are presented with evidence, objective evidence, um, that your position is questionable or wrong? How quickly are you willing to effectively resolve an argument for the betterment of both parties? As in, you know, are you really looking to find a best solution or do you just want to be right? Um, this is a resiliency thing for a lot of different reasons. Um, what style of grieving are you prone to experience? Now, for people who are much younger, you might not have an answer for this. Unfortunately, in today's day and age, we cannot make that statement as uniformly as we used to. And yes, we're going to have a talk about grieving as well. But it's really important because grieving is one of those things where, especially if a couple um, suffers the same loss, if they don't have compatible grief experiences, if they don't share their grief experiences with each other, um, they don't even think about it, I swear. If I thought you were just going to behave yourself, I would let you up here, but I know better than that. Her Royal Majesty Queen Mab Beulis, the raven floofiness, would love to photobomb. Not today. Not today. Uh, mostly because I'm wearing pajama pants and she will claw out of me and uh, no. Canvas dungarees or nothing. Uh, anyway, getting back to it. If a couple shares a grief, a loss, and they don't have compatible grieving styles, it will, they're, they're getting divorced. They're breaking up. That is a thing that will happen. 
If they don't, it means that they slip into a state of a very unsuccessful and long protracted relationship. And the longer that relationship stays unsuccessful, where they are not getting what they need out of it, where they are not empathetic with each other, where they are not self-reflective of each other, uh, uh, within themselves. It's a uh, hell on earth. It's pretty bad. So when we say stuff like, what style of grieving are you prone to? What we mean is, you know, do you want to go see a counselor? Um, do you want to cry by yourself in the bathtub? Do you want somebody to sit with you? Do you want somebody to uh, hold your hair while you vomit? Everybody does it differently. We're not judging. In the same vein, how quickly and how do you tend to forgive people? You know, if somebody has done you a slight, if you've gotten mad at them, what's your process? How do you, how do you choose to forgive them? And it is a process. We're going to get to that later as well. I promise it's going to be a thing. A big one is how do you handle stress? Um, do you need time by yourself? Uh, do you need a back rub? Um, do you need um, hours and hours of hot monkey sex? Do you need to vegetate and not do anything for hours on end? How do you handle stress? And how does your partner handle stress? Gauging your resiliency in how quickly you go from an experience, an intense experience, usually intense negative experience, back to your baseline. That's resiliency, okay? This last one, excuse me. Oh, goodness gracious, excuse me again. Inspire each other, okay? This is probably the one thing that ties in best to both the long-term and the short-term types of a successful positive relationship inspiration does this person motivate you to be the best version of yourself do you find yourself uninstalling old programs that aren't really serving you anymore um, do you want to ex start exploring the things that you've put off for months or years do you find yourself expressing kindness more easily I know it seems like kind of specific but it really isn't because we're talking about love I mean, yeah, relationship, 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 but all of these things, these things specifically, we're looking for these to be active in a romantic, loving relationship. When you have love active in a significant way in your life, you're, it tends to bleed over into all other areas. You, uh, might give a little extra money to the homeless guy on the street or give him your leftover steak. Maybe you, uh, you know, just open the door for a stranger, you know? Maybe help a little old dog across the street. Maybe find a home for a, you know, lost little old lady. You never know. Do you find yourself expressing kindness more easily? And that's usually one of the, one of the signs of number four that you're inspiring each other. Be with someone who motivates you to do better in life because relationships are more than just falling in love. It's about inspiring each other. See how I am? It's about inspiring each other to become a better version of yourself day in and day out. This does not mean that if you aren't a better version of yourself every day, you have failed at success or love or whatever, but it does mean that you're just having a bad day. It's okay. If your partner in general wants you to, inspires you to be, and it's not like they're sitting here going, you know what you should do is really sit down and finish that graduate degree. Or, you would look great with purple hair. Or, I don't know, 
lose 10 pounds or gain five pounds or whatever, you know? Eat more bacon. We can all agree that that's fine. When somebody inspires you, it's, a, it's your choice. I mean, that's, that's the difference between somebody just being, oh, I'm supporting you, hey, this is great. And it being your, and, and being an inspiration because it, when somebody inspires you, it's your choice. It's kind of cool. All right. Yeah. Sorry, I just built this today. That's going to take a minute to get used to. So the thing is, love is absolutely a fantastic and critical part of life. You know, we love our family, our friends, our lovers, our partners, and quite frequently, it's what makes life worth living, whether we are actively supporting it or we're pursuing it. And quite frankly, we can apply this idea about inspiring people around us and being inspired by people around us to all different types of relationships. Can you just imagine, I mean, think for a second, imagine how incredible you could be as a person if everyone around you was supporting you, not just scholastically or vocationally, but just to be the best version of yourself. If everyone around you was so cool, was so awesome that you couldn't help but be awesome too i mean it's kind of like hanging out with me but you know whatever so i know that there is a huge portion of the population and they only think of romantical relationships when we use the word love oh my god <sighs> i've really got to get his toenails flipped A lot of people only think of romance when we talk about love, but I really want you to understand again how successful relationships happen. And you have to see, maybe experience, examine how successful relationships happen in all of the versions of your relationships. It's really important to step out of that tiny little romance box because if you recognize that you have intimate relationships, trust vulnerable relationships with your parents, your siblings, friends, whatever. All of the relationships that you have prior to romance that are intimate, that are trust, these all predicate your capacity to engage in successful romantic relationships. Okay. So think about like your very, very best friend when you were growing up, uh, the person that you were absolutely closest to, you know, or maybe it was the sibling that you had an intense connection with or uh, one or both of your parents. Regardless uh, of who the person was, call into mind the closest relationship that you had when you were a child and that will always be the standard by which your adult relationships will be measured. And this is true regardless of whether they were healthy or toxic, whether they were short or long-term, part-time, full-time, it does not matter if it ended, how it ended, when it ended. It's a huge part of the legacy software that we've been talking about, the stuff that permanently affects the way all other programs are installed. So when we have a hard time even figuring out what successful has ever meant, we got to go back to this part and kind of define that for us and then start unraveling what did we get out of the relationship how were these four elements that we were just talking about um satisfied were they satisfied how much of myself did i see in that how much of uh, how much was i able to empathize with the other person so your homework assignment, should you choose to uh, engage, 
is uh, pop over to the Discord channel. Um, you can get to that in my About section down here. Um, and tell me about it. Tell me about who those relationships were. Tell me about how you have had successful relationships, whether they were positive relationships or negative relationships, short, long. Tell me about your most successful relationships and tell me about the ones that you had the hardest time. Please don't PM me. I'm going to put a whole other, <laughs> I'm going to set it up so that you guys can, well, I guess you could PM me, but uh, I, I'm going to put a whole section where people can post anonymously. It's about as hard to say as some of them. All right, so that, that's your homework. That's what I want you to do. Um, now, as I was like putting the script together, because uh, you know me, squirrel brain, got to write it all down. I was thinking about examples of obviously short relationships and successful relationships and things like that. And I did want to share with you the story of the shortest first date of my entire life. Oh, this is funny. So... Uh, back before, um, oh golly, this was like 10 plus years ago. It was, no, eight, I don't know. It was back before uh, Gryphon and I got together. So, online dating, absolutely love it. Nerd out hard. It's just what you do, especially when you don't like going into the out. I've never liked going into the out. So I had talked to this guy, um, and uh, we'd gone back and forth a little bit, and it was about three weeks between, um, <laughs> there's no time before me. I know it's hard to imagine my love, but there was like two weeks, two weeks where I existed before you, <laughs> before I met you. Um, uh, we got, we went back and forth for like, I don't know, I guess two weeks. <laughs> and before we finally like worked it out and, and, and could meet up and, and it was it's a little odd. Um, we met up at, at a, a coffee shop, you know, um, and he was already there. I, I went and I, and I got my, my coffee and I paid for it and I sat down and I said, oh, it's so nice to see you. And uh, then he started talking for like, 20 minutes straight um, and not like talking like this no he had studied my profile like it was a Rosetta Stone because he talked about how he had tried to rent all of the movies that I had listed and there were a lot of them and he had tried to find all of the books that I had listed and there were even more of them he tried to find the bands that I had and he and this I mean and he was just talking and talking and talking about what he thought about this movie and that movie and he'd even tracked down some really obscure ones and he was very concerned about this title that I had mentioned because he could not find it anywhere yeah weird oh my gosh and towards the end of it he's like but I, I need you to understand this because I know how important it is to you I need you to know that I mean single mom I get it, I get it, but you, you need to know, I love children. And I said, me too, want to trade recipes? He did not laugh. He did not think it was funny. In fact, he got downright offended. And I said, you know what, we're, we're done. We're so done here. It's it's fine. It's it's not. No, it's you, but it's it's all right, you know. But I'm gonna save us a lot of time and a lot of hassle, and I'm calling it. This is not gonna work because if that wasn't funny to you, uh, oh honey, oh honey. I uh, made sure he left first, and so he could follow me. But I mean, that was technically a completely successful relationship. We each got everything that we possibly could out of it. Everything that that relationship was capable of giving. He found a lot of very weird movies and very weird music and very, very weird books that 
might have changed his life, I don't know. And I found out that some people don't get my sense of humor and are also extremely creepy. So, um, that is it for today, guys. Thank you so much for joining us. A huge shout out to all of the people who made this possible. Um, not the least of which is Albert Ramon and the greatest fan in the world, Flint, for the best thank you note ever written. Uh, Tivka Wolf, uh, the artist and writer of Kim Chi Cuddles for having an incredible insight into just being a human in all its myriad of different ways. Khalil Gibran for uh, almost always being relevant. Kevin McLeod for the start and end music, uh, which I may or may not have zoned out to myself for several hours at a stretch. And to my awesomest partner, St. Griffin, for uh, modding and keeping my squirrel brain from eating my life. So follow me here on Twitch uh, to get notified when we go live. We've also got the Twitters over at Love Bites Hard with a Y TV. And it's the same handle over on the tubes of you when we upload the video for long-term viewing. You can pop over to the Discord server too and send me questions, talk about stuff after the stream, you know, stuff and things. Um, thank you again, everybody. I will see you next week and bring your friends because, you know, everything is better with friends. <laughs>